The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com slash support. You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com All right, people. Welcome. Welcome to this uh, fourth lecture in the series on uh, resources. Uh, today we have a speaker from Japan, James Corbett. Um, James Corbett is well known among storm circles, so I am actually a little bit interested in who of you already knew James Corbett and his work before, before this. Okay, this is about, wow, that's about more than half, I would say. Okay, so the other half uh, basically comes for the topic, um, instead of for James Corbett. So for those people, I, I, I think it's useful that I explain a little bit about what type of journalist uh, James Corbett is. Um, what he does, he calls himself an open source journalist, so basically he looks at all the available information and then he synthesizes it. But you could also uh, call that open source intelligence. He is basically a one-man intelligence agency. Uh, who integrates information from pretty much any source and then comes up with a narrative uh, that is usually a, narr uh, usually a story that is very easily to understand. Well, not, e not so easy to understand, but it helps you to understand how the world might be working. So for me, and for I think many other people, uh, listening to his media, especially his podcasts, is extremely empowering. You learn things that you would not normally learn from the regular mainstream media. And that is, that is kind of special and for that reason we have invited him uh, uh, tonight here. So I think I shouldn't talk too much and let uh, James do the talking. James, please. Okay, so thank you very much, thank you very much. First of all, thank you, Chirid, for the lovely introduction, and thank you for setting the ball in motion for me to come here to Groningen, I appreciate that. And let me also thank Studium General and their Dutch hospitality that I've been shown so far on this trip, I very much appreciate it. And of course, lastly but not leastly, thank you to all of you for showing up tonight, I really do appreciate you coming here for this lecture. And as you can see, of course, this is a lecture entitled The Secret War, Gladio, and the Battle for Eurasia. So why don't we start by talking about what we're going to talk about. Namely, Central Asia is one of the regions that we'll be talking about tonight. And Central Asia is a vast expanse of the map whose defining characteristic is its ability to defy, to defy characterization. Uh, stretching from the shores of the Caspian Sea on the west side to the border of China in the east, and from Iran and Pakistan's doorstep in the south to Russia's in the north. It encompasses everything from the snow-capped slopes of Victory Peak in Kyrgyzstan to the remarkable door to hell in Turkmenistan's Karakum Desert, which, if it is not on your list of things to see before you die, you should put it on that list, uh, to the sprawling grasslands of the Kazakh steppe, and settled by migrants from the Persian, Turkic, Chinese, and Slavic civilizations, its inhabitants speak Kyrgyz, Kazakh, Russian, Tajik, Uzbek, Turkmen, and include Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, and assorted others. The much smaller Caucasus region is a narrow land bridge sandwiched between the Black and Caspian Seas, and is equally diverse. In fact, the region contains over 50 ethnic groups and is home to three local language families, which is something that uh, ling linguists are still puzzle over, and there's, I mean, it's very, very fascinating in and of itself. And there are several dozen languages spoken in the region, from the obscure Botan Neo-Aramaic, 
tongue, which is, has less than 500 native speakers, to the more widely spoken Azerbaijan and Armenian languages. But despite the rich culture of this history uh, and the history of the region, it is still completely off the radar screens of most of the general public. Tajikistan, Abkhazia, and Astrakhan Oblast are hardly names to conjure by in the popular imagination, after all. But the fact that those names do not resonate with us is perhaps something that is part of a grander strategy that we're going to talk about tonight. And those names that do resonate with us tend to be the names that we have been seen, that have, we have seen in various media stories in the West. For example, Dagestan equates to the Boston bombing in the minds of most Americans, and Chechnya might be familiar to Europeans as that place that Russia is at war with. But just because these stands and oblasts and autonomous republics and, and autonomous regions in this area do not resonate with the general public for the most part, does not mean that they are not important squares on the global chessboard. And just because they may not be on the radar of the general public does not mean they are not on the radar of some of the most powerful players in global geopolitics. And as evidence of that, I present to you the United States Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce, which sounds about as important to global geopolitics as the Groningen Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> but when you actually look at some of the current and former advisors, directors, and board members of this organization, you encounter some of the richest and most powerful players in global geopolitics. For example, Former Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney. James Baker III, a Bush family advisor, and his son, James Baker IV, for those of you keeping track at home. Uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, of course. Brent Scowcroft, Richard Armitage of the US State Department, and perennial Washington insider and former National Security Advisors, Big New Brzezinski, along with many, many others that are, I think, worth checking into. So the question becomes, what is it that these people, some of the most influential people in the field of global geopolitics over the past 50 years, know about this region that the general public doesn't? And I think there are at least two answers to that question. The first answer is the old real estate adage, location, location, location. The region's key location in the backyard of some of the key players and powers of the Eurasian landmass, Russia and China foremost amongst them, has made it a geostrategic prize stretching back thousands of years, dominated at different times and in varying degrees by Persian empires, Chinese dynasties, Mongol invaders, and Soviet forces, the region has a rich history of being acted upon and a relatively short history as a geopolitical actor in its own right. Its position has long made it a key transport route from the Han Dynasty's uh, Silk Road connecting China to Persia thousands of years ago, to the current uh, attempt by Xi Jinping to make a new Silk Road of the 21st century that includes connecting China to Turkey and beyond straight through the heart of this region. But more important even than its location and strategic value are the region's vast, largely untapped resources. The oil and gas fields of the Caspian Sea region are particularly sought after, containing the third largest reserves of any fields on the planet. Azerbaijan in the Caucasus and Kazakhstan in Central Asia have, both have direct access to Caspian Sea oil, with Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan providing ample gas reserves. The dream of a trans-Caspian pipeline has been in the works for years now to transport Central Asian reserves across the Southern Ca uh, Caucasus and the so-called BTC pipeline, funneling the energy through Azerbaijan and Ger Georgia to Turkey, and then off to Europe. And that has been equally prized uh, as a way for Europe to find an alternative to Russia's increasingly threatening stranglehold over energy known as Gazprom. The region also contains strategically important deposits of uranium, as well as industrially useful minerals such as copper, manganese, tungsten, zinc, etc. And also gold. Don't discount gold. Another equally important, although seldom acknowledged, resource in this region revolves around the extensive opium trade, especially in Afghanistan. The Afghan opium trade is estimated to bring in as much as $200 billion annually, accounting for as much as 92% of the world's supply. 
As we shall see, control of this region involves domination of the especially lucrative business and all of the attendant economic benefits that result from this connection. The importance of a long-term U.S. presence in the region to establish Western dominance over this location and its resources is no secret. In fact, it has been written about extensively and repeatedly, time and again, by the think tanks that typically serve as the mouthpiece for NATO's foreign policy interests. Case exhibit number one. Take, for example, a 1992 analysis uh, of the region from RAND's National Defense Research Institute entitled Central Asia, the New Geopolitics, which was written shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, while the newly independent republics of the region were still orienting themselves to their new geopolitical reality. And it was penned by Graham Fuller, a former CIA station chief in Kabul, whose name will come up again later in our study. So keep that face and that name in mind. Uh, he wrote, it is primarily Central Asia's stra uh, strategic geopolitical location, truly at the continent's center, and the broadly undesirable course of events that could emerge if the region were to drift toward instability that constitute the primary American interest in the region. Thus, given the potential for untoward developments in the region for Western interests, modest hands-on American influence in the region is desirable. Hmm. Uh, this modest hands-on American influence gained momentum and by 2004, we had an article published in the Cambridge Review of International Affairs called The United States and Central Asia in the Steps to Stay? Question mark. Zvante E. Cornell of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute raising some of the key reasons for increasing U.S. involvement in the region. As U.S. engagement in Central Asia becomes more permanent, it will increasingly become a factor in both regional politics and the domestic politics of the several Central Asian countries. That role raises a host of questions. Chief among them is how regional powers such as Russia and China will react to the U.S. presence. A second concerns the implication both for the political development among the region's states and for the future of radical Islam. Also in 2011, the Project 2049 Institute, which includes Zbigniew Brzezinski's son on its board of directors, published a document proclaiming an agenda for the future of U.S.-Central Asia relations, which contains this interesting passage. U.S. policymakers have been careful to avoid the metaphor of a great game in Central Asia. Yet, it has been often invoked by others, not least by observers in Moscow, Beijing, and other neighboring powers. The U.S. must continue to reject this metaphor, for such notions are based on flawed assumptions and fraught with risks for the United States. Interesting. So what is this great game that the think tanks like the Project 2049 Institute are so eager to avoid comparisons to. The great game refers to the struggle for supremacy between the British and the Russians in the Central Asia region, primarily in the 19th century. The game broadly took place from the signing of the Russo-Persian Treaty of 1813 until the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, but although the term was coined in the early 19th century, it didn't hit the popular imagination until Rud Rudyard Kipling's Kim was published in 1901. It was three years after that, in 1904, that the Geographical Journal published an article that articulated the reasons these great powers were engaged in the struggle for this piece of the globe. The article was called The Geographical Pivot of History, and it was written by Sir Halford John, Mac Sir Halford John Mackinder, P.C., don't forget the PC, Privy Council, very important. The director of the London School of Economics that was founded by the Fabian Society and folded into the heart of the British establishment in the University of London in 1900, and just as an example of that, the cornerstone of the old building on Hodden Street was laid by King George V himself, interestingly. Mackinder is considered the father of the study of geopolitics, and the geographical pivot of history is the doc document that is often said to be the founding document of geopolitics and constitutes the first formulation of what would come to be uh, Mackinder's heartland theory. This theory states that the division of what Mackinder called the world island into inherently divided, isolated areas was the principle by which we could understand the evolution of history and the future of the world. 
Each of these areas had its own heart part to play in the unfolding of that history, with the area he called the heartland of the central Eurasian landmass being the pivot point from which a civilization could derive the geopolitical and economic leverage with which to dominate the world as a whole. This was summarized in a famous dictum from his 1919 work, Democratic Ideals and Reality, Who Rules East Europe Commands the Heartland? Who Rules the Heartland Commands the World Island? Who Rules the World Island Commands the World? Looking at the map of what Mackinder had in mind for the heartland, it's apparent that the heart of this heartland is indeed the Central Asia Caucasus region. This is what Russia and Britain were so intent on wresting from each other's control in the 19th century great game. Control of the region from which the building of a world empire would be possible. And this is why the Project 2049 Institute and the other mouthpieces for the establishment in the US NATO foreign policy interests want to downplay this idea. They don't under any circumstances want you to think about the idea that the US and its NATO allies are building regional domination in a part of the globe from which they plan to project world dominance. But fast forward to 1997, and in that year, our old friend Zbigniew Brzezinski released his book, The Grand Chessboard, American Primacy and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. Because evidently, Zbigniew Brzezinski was not so shy about proclaiming the quest for world domination. Uh, he also did not mince his words about the Eurasian heartland and how important it is to America's global primacy. For America, the chief geopolitical prize is Eurasia. For half a millennium, world affairs were dominated by Eurasian powers and peoples who fought with one another for regional domination and reached out for global power. Now, a non-Eurasian power is preeminent in Eurasia, and America's global primacy is directly dependent on how long and how effectively its preponderance on the Eurasian continent is sustained. He goes on to refine Mackinder's heartland notion down to a specific area that he calls the Eurasian Balkans. And this area is precisely the Central Asia Caucasus region. He explains its, important thus, its importance thusly. The Eurasian Balkans, astride the inevitably emerging transportation network meant to link more directly Eurasia's richest and most industrious Western and Eastern extremities, are also geopolitically significant. Moreover, they are of importance from the standpoint of security and historical ambitions to at least three of their most immediate and more powerful neighbors, namely Russia, Turkey, and Iran, with China also signaling an increasing political interest in the region. But the Eurasian Balkans are infinitely more important as a potential economic prize. An enormous concentration of natural gas and oil reserves is located in the region, in addition to important minerals, including gold. The use of the metaphor of the Balkans is doubly evocative for students of history. It represents not only the strife and ethnic conflict we saw in the Balkanization of Yugoslavia at the end of the 20th century, but also the powder keg of tensions that ignited the First World War at the beginning of the 20th century. Subsequently, Brzezinski predicted that the first great war of the 21st century would take place in this Eurasian Balkans region, and lo and behold, four years after uh, the Grand Chess Board was published, the first great war of the 21st century was being waged in Afghanistan by the United States and its NATO allies. Meet the new great game, same as the old great game. This time, it's NATO against China, Russia, and what might loosely be termed a resistance bloc, but the idea is almost the same dominate Central Asia Caucasus and use it as a pivot point to dominate the world. The old and the new great game are similar in many ways. The old great game sprang from the British fears that Russian incursion into Central Asia would threaten to topple their hold over the crown jewel of the British Empire, India. The new great game springs from the fear that Russia and or China, Chinese dominance over Central Asia and the Caucasus would prevent NATO from achieving its goal of full spectrum dominance. The old great game involved the British invasion of Afghanistan in 1838 and attempt to install a puppet regime. The new great game involved the NATO invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 and attempt to install a puppet regime. The old great game relied heavily on espionage, spycraft, and subterfuge to undermine Russia's sway over the heartland. And as we shall see, the new great game also heavily relies on covert means to undermine Russian and Chinese influence in the region. 
To understand the way that subterfuge is being used in the new great game today, we must first understand an important clandestine operation which is commonly known as Operation Gladio. In very brief and rough terms, Operation Gladio was a NATO plan to use stay-behind paramilitary armies to counter a potential Soviet invasion of Europe. Although this is the way that Operation Gladio is commonly understood amongst the general public, almost every piece of that description is technically incorrect. Firstly, Operation Gladio was not a name for the overall program, which involved 12 NATO member nations. Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Spain, and Turkey, and four neutral countries, Austria, Finland, Sweden, and Switzerland. But the pro Operation Gladio referred specifically to its most famous incarnation in Italy. In Belgium, the operation was codenamed SDRA8. Sweden had its Project 26. In Greece, it was apologies to Greek speakers, locos orenon katadromon. <laughs> and here in the Netherlands, it was G-I-I-I-C, later rebranded as G7, thankfully for those of us who have problems saying I three times in a row. <laughs> Secondly, the operation was not inherently a NATO one. It was first coordinated in 1948 by a transatlantic body based in France known as the Western Union Clandestine Committee. After the creation of NATO in 1949, the body was folded into the organization's Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, SHAPE, and uh, under that revised, the revised name of the Clandestine Planning Committee. The plan's origins stretch back arguably even further to the creation of MI6's Section D in Britain, a ramshackle group of recruits from England's North Sea coast that would sabotage, uh, that would com commit sabotage and guerrilla warfare in the event of a Nazi invasion of the British Isles. The central role of the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination and Special op Operations Branch of MI6 in establishing the operation, as well as the training of stay-behind forces alongside British SAA SAS units at Fort Moncton and American Special Forces at the infamous School of the, American, uh, uh, School of the Americas needs also to be stressed. Thirdly, although the individual stay-behind programs were organized in Europe, the scope of their operations were not limited to Europe and strayed far from any supposed mandate to prepare for a Soviet invasion. As we shall see, Gladio operations included and include everything from drug running and money laundering to terror attacks and political assassinations. I won't get into the specifics of how these stay-behind units operated in the various countries or the various incidents that they participated in. If any part of the Gladio story is well known, and I hope it is, but if any part is well known, it is the operations in Europe and their role in the events of Italy's years of lead. These topics have been covered in great detail by very capable writers, filmmakers, historians, researchers, documentarians, and I'll refer you to some of the most valuable English language resources on the overall program, including Alan Frankovich's groundbreaking documentary that you can't really see very well in that picture, Gladio, uh, the Ringmasters, uh, Daniel Ganser's uh, sem seminal work, NATO's Secret Armies, Richard Cottrell's Gladio, NATO's Dagger at the Heart of Europe, and the various resources available at sites like operation-gladio.net. What is important for our study today is the strategic doctrine employed by Gladio operatives known as the strategy of tension. This doctrine involves the creation, encouragement, or exacerbation of political, religious, ethnic, or, or other forms of conflict in order to incite fear in a population and manipulate public opinion. An off-sighted example of the strategy of tension are the years of lead in Italy that rocked that nation with a wave of terrorist atrocities from the 1969 bombing of the Piazza Fontana to the Bologna railway station bombing of 1980. The story of the links between NATO Gladio operations and the various paramilitary groups where, uh, whose bombings, kidnappings, and assassinations terrorized the nation, nation is a fascinating one, but far too detailed for today's study. The takeaway point is that the national psychosis caused by spectacular terror attacks can be used to turn public opinion against certain groups and make actions that were formerly politically inconceivable virtually inevitable. 
It isn't difficult to see how this strategy could be used in some form in a region as linguistically, eth ethnically, culturally, and religiously diverse and divisive as Central Asia and the Caucasus. Indeed, as Brzezinski points out in regards to his Eurasian Balkans concept, every one of the Eurasian Balkans countries suffers from serious internal difficulties. All of them have frontiers that are either the object of claims by neighbors or are zones of ethnic resentment, few are nationally homogenous, and some are already embroiled in territorial, ethnic, or religious violence. With regards to the Central Asia Caucasus region in particular, Gladio operations in Turkey are of primary importance. Noting that the Turkish Gladio oper operations relied on cooperation with the nationalistic, racist, baldly expansionist pan-Turkism movement, Daniel Ganser describes the Turkish secret army as, quote, more violent than that of any other stay behind in Western Europe. He describes the origin of the Turkish stay behind, known as counter guerrilla, thusly. Under the headline, The Origins of Gladio in Turkey, the Paris-based intelligence newsletter reported in 1990 that they had obtained one of the recently declassified original strategy documents en engendering the Western European stay behind or Gladio network. U.S. Army General Staff's top secret March 28, 1949 overall strategic concepts. In an adjoining document, JSPC 891-6, section tab B, a specific reference is made to Turkey highlighting how the pan-Turkism movement could be exploited strategically by the United States. Turkey, according to the Pentagon document, is an extremely favorable territory for the establishment of both guerrilla units and secret army reserves. Politically, the Turks are strongly nationalistic and anti-communistic, and the presence of the Red Army in Turks will cause national feeling to run high. Intelligence newsletter thereafter correctly related that the Turkish secret army called Counter Guerrilla was run by the Special Warfare Department and consisted of five branches. Training group, including interrogation and psychological warfare techniques. Special unit, specialized since 1984 in anti-Kurd operations. Special section, special operations in Cyprus. Coordination group, also called the Third Bureau, and Administrative Section. The violent atrocities committed by counter guerrilla are beyond the scope of this investigation, but they include a September 1955 false flag bombing of a key Turkish target in Greece, which was blamed on the Greek police, participation in three military coups against Turkey's own government, the torture of political opponents in the torture, torture villa of Erenkoy, and assorted robberies, assassinations, kidnapping, sabotage, and other terrorist activities. In the vicious Turkish nationalist movement, with its interest in uniting all of the Turkish people into one pan-Turkic nation, the NATO found a convenient ally in its quest to counter Soviet influence in the Caucasus region and to gain a toehold in the Eurasian Balkans. In order to understand how this alliance operated, let's examine one particular person who has been identified as one of the top Turkish gladiators, Abdullah Chatli. Probably the single most famous member of the counter guerrilla, Abdullah Chatli's remarkable and highly improbable career tells the story of assassinations, terror attacks, drug running, daring prison escapes, and international intrigue outrageous enough to make even the most imaginative Hollywood scriptwriter blush. Beginning as a petty street thug with the nationalist movement, Chatley rose through the ranks to become a brutal enforcer for the dreaded Grey Wolves youth organization connected to the Turkish Gladio movement. By 1978, he had become the second in command of the organization and a top counter guerrilla operative implicated in multiple high-profile assassinations, including the murder of Abdi Ipeki, the country's most well-known newspaper editor. Forced underground by his growing notoriety, Chatley became an important international gladiator, participating in the 1981 assassination attempt of the Pope. He traveled with Italian gladiator Stefano Dalla della Chiei to Latin America and Miami in 1982, and then headed to France, where he planned the bombing of the Armenian Genocide Memorial at Alfredville and the failed assassination attempt against activist Ara Turanian. In 1984, it seemed that the long arm of the law had finally caught up with him. Paid by his Turkish intelligence handlers in heroin, 
Chatley was arrested in Paris for drug trafficking and sentenced to seven years imprisonment. By 1988, he was sent to Switzerland, where he was also wanted for drug trafficking. But in March 1990, he was sprung from prison in a nearly unbelievable prison break that involved the use of a helicopter. Le Monde Diplomatique, in an explosive report in 1998 on the Turkish deep state, referred vaguely to the quote-unquote mysterious forces who helped him to escape, but others have specifically identified the escape helicopter as a NATO vehicle. In subsequent years, while still an international fugitive on Interpol's most wanted list and wanted by authorities of multiple countries for a series of crimes, Chatley returned to Turkey where he was recruited by the police for special missions and entered and exited the United Kingdom and the United States with complete impunity. This is the character profile of an Operation Gladio gladiator. And I hope we can realize that when we see this type of remarkable, amazing, unbelievable career of someone who is consistently, at every turn, able to evade every type of police authority, every type of law of the land, every type of constitutional rule, wherever he travels, and is always protected and always busted out, I think we understand that there is a deep state that is working to lay the groundwork and to prepare the way for someone like this. So this is a confirmed Gladio operative who had a really remarkable career. So keep that in mind as we proceed with our analysis tonight. Returning to the question of Gladio interference in the Central Asia Caucasus area of operations, one lowlight from Chatley's ignoble career is particularly instructive. In 1995, Chatley participated in a planned coup attempt against Azerbaijani President Helmar Aliyev, the father of the country's current president. The planned assassination failed, but Chatley, as usual, was not caught or brought to justice for the, his participation in the scheme. But while the assassination itself did not result in the death of Aliyev, it did have a desirable effect for NATO's designs on the South Caucasus. From that point on, Azerbaijan began, began to leave the diplomatic orbit of its old Soviet-era Russian masters and has since become a staunchly Western-oriented nation with an all-star roster of power players on its U.S.-Azerbaijani Chamber of Commerce. And ongoing relations with Chevron, Texaco, BB, BP, Pennzoil, and every other major oil conglomerate you can think of. In fact, the country has been a NATO partner and prospective member of the alliance for several years now, a potentially important NATO ally right in Russia's backyard, and one with access to the prized Caspian oil and gas field reserves, and the pipelines that will help to transport that out of there. But all careers, no matter how remarkable, come to an end. And the end of Abdullah Chatley's career was perhaps fittingly almost as amazing as his career itself. At approximately 7.25 p.m. on the evening of November 3, 1996, a Mercedes 600 SEL crashed into a truck near the northwestern Turkish town of Susurluk, killing three of the four passengers. But this was no ordinary car crash. Among the dead, a senior police chief, a former beauty queen, and Abdullah Chatlet. The survivor, a Turkish MP who came away with a fractured skull and a broken leg. A 1998 LA Times report on the crash described the scene this way. Strewn amid the roadside wreckage was evidence of Chatley's collusion with the Turkish Secret Service. Along with several handguns, silencers, a cache of narcotics, and a government-approved weapons permit, Chatley was carrying six photo ID cards, each with a different name, and special diplomatic credentials issued by Turkish authorities. The importance of this car crash to the course of Turkish politics is difficult to overstate. For many, it conclusively confirmed the deep state connections between terrorists like Chatley and the upper reaches of government power that many had long believed existed. The resulting scandal led to a series of investigations and reports, as well as arrests, convictions, resignations, reforms, promotions, and the death of several Susurluk investigators in car crashes that mysteriously resembled the Susurluk crash itself. And according to at least one FBI whistleblower, Susurluk marks the beginning of a transition from the original Gladio operations using ultranationalist operatives 
to a Gladio Plan B involving Islamic terrorism as the conduit for the strategy of tension. The whistleblower in question is Sibel Edmonds, hired by the FBI to work as a translator in the Washington field office in the wake of 9-11. She worked with agents around the United States, helping to translate intercepted communications in a number of counterintelligence cases, including Agent Joel Roberts in the Chicago field office, whose targets included Abdullah Chatley and some of his Gladio associates. While there, one of the translators she was working with, uh, Jan Dickerson, uh, ha, who was Jan Dickerson, who had worked for both the American Turkish Council and the Assembly of Turkish American Associations, organizations that the FBI publicly confirmed were targets of FBI counterintelligence operations. Her husband, Douglas Dickerson, was a major in the U.S. Air Force who had served in Ankara working on weapons procurement for the Pentagon in the Central Asia region. In December 2001, the Dickersons visited Edmonds and her husband at their home in Alexandria, Virginia, and attempted to recruit them into a Turkish spying ring that had penetrated the FBI, the Pentagon, and the State Department. She refused, and her complaints about the Dickersons and their involvement with Turkish lobbying groups eventually led to her firing. After years of fighting this dismissal and attempting to go on record with her knowledge, first through official FBI channels and then through the court system, the FBI was eventually forced to admit that her claims had, quote, some basis in fact, a judgment later bolstered by a Department of Justice Inspector General report that concluded, quote, many of Edmund's core allegations relating to the co-workers were supported by either documentary evidence or witnesses other than Edmund's. And noting that, quote, the evidence clearly corroborated Edmund's allegations, unquote, about Jan Dickerson's work problems. Despite all of this, a little-known evidentiary rule known as the state secrets privilege was invoked by the Justice Department to remove her First Amendment rights and prevent her from going on record about many of the specifics of her case. This led to her being labeled, quote, the most gagged person in American history by the American Civil Liberties Union. Edmonds paints the story of the FBI's counterintelligence operations against a Gladio network that had contacts and operatives in the United States, but protection from powerful Washington players, like some of those on the board of the U.S.-Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce and similar organizations. After the turning point at Susserluk, these operations started to focus on Islamic terrorists and radicals, who presumably could equally well be used to maintain a strategy of tension and help ac accomplish foreign policy goals in Central Asia and the Caucasus region. Again, it's important to look at some of the careers of some of those who have been identified as part of this Gladio B plan uh, in order to better understand whether or not they are, in fact, what has been claimed about them. However, we have to note that unlike in the case of Abdullah Chatli, we have no official independent confirmations of the existence of the Gladio B operation or its various op operatives. Here we are relying on information in the public record which corroborates Edmund's claims and paints a vivid picture of the intersection between Muslim extremists, drug runners, terrorists, and money launderers with the upper levels of the US State Department, Pentagon, and NATO. One such person is Fethullah Gulen, a Turkish imam who fled political prosecution in Turkey for advocating that an Islamic state replace the existing Turkish government. Interestingly, he fled to the United States, eventually settling in Pennsylvania. He then set up an educational foundation, the Gulen Movement, and within four years had opened up 350 madrasas in the Central Asia Caucasus region. His network would go on to include Islamic schools in over 140 countries with an estimated net worth of over $20 billion. In January 2001, a Turkish prosecutor, citing an Ankara University report whose author was subsequently assassinated, claimed that there is a link between Gulen and the CIA, which included agency help in securing passports for the school's English teachers in the Central Asia Caucasus region. This claim was bolstered by former Turkish intelligence chief Osman Nuri Gundes, whose memoirs revealed that 130 of those English teachers in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan alone were actually CIA operatives, issued special diplomatic passports under a pro program codenamed Friendship Bridge. Interestingly, the Washington Post attempted to deny the allegations by seeking comment from Graeme Fuller, 
who you might remember as the author of the Central Asia, the new geopolitics report that we referred to earlier. Uh, Fuller was a former CIA station chief in Kabul who claimed that the idea of a Gulen CIA connection was improbable, despite admitting he has, quote, absolutely no concrete personal knowledge whatsoever about this, end quote. <laughs> even more interestingly, talk about non-denial denials. Even more interestingly, Fuller himself wrote a letter of reference for Gulen that was then used in Gulen's ongoing legal battle over his immigration status in the U.S., the remarkable rise of this imam, with no particular background or accomplishments, to become the head of a multi-billion dollar Islamic school network operated from a secret compound in Pennsylvania that appears to be working with the CIA in the highly sensitive Central Asia Caucasus region, appears to fit in line with what we know about the deep state actors in this covert battle for influence in this highly prized square of the chessboard. Another extremely interesting figure is Yasin al-Qadi. He was an alleged financier of Islamic terror that was the subject of an intensive investigation by FBI agent Robert Wright. Wright's investigation, codenamed Vulgar Betrayal, discovered evidence that implicated al-Qadi in a terrorist financing ring centered in Chicago that linked to the 1998 African embassy bombings but when he proposed a criminal investigation, his supervisor flew into a rage, yelling, quote, you will not open criminal investigations. I forbid any of you, you will not open criminal investigations against any of these intelligence subjects, end quote. Wright was taken off the vulgar betrayal investigation one year later, and the investigation itself was shut down the following year. In 1999 and 2000, the UN placed sanctions on al-Qadi, who was identified in UN Security Council resolutions as a suspected associate of al-Qaeda. At the same time, al-Qadi was also a key investor in a company called P-Tech, which marketed enterprise architecture software designed to provide complete God's eye view of an organization's structure from transactions, systems, and processes to inventory, transactions, and personnel. And PTEC's client list included some of the most sensitive databases in the United States, including the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, in the Pentagon, the FBI, the Secret Service, the White House, the Navy, the Air Force, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, and NATO. According to PTEC's own business plan, the company had a contract to work on modeling the FAA's network management, network security, configuration management, fault management, performance management, application administration, network accounting management, and user help desk operations that was operative on the morning of 9-11 and FAA's failure. After 9-11, PTEC's offices were raided and the company's CEO and CFO were eventually indicted and Yasin al-Qadi was placed on a special terrorist finance watch list by the U.S. Treasury Department. Despite being watch listed by the U both the U.N. Security Council and U.S. Treasury Department, al-Qadi continued to operate internationally with an Albanian passport spending time in Turkey. He, is, he has since been revealed to have engaged in numerous meetings with then Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the Turkish intelligence chief, and earlier this year, the ex-Istanbul police chief revealed that Erdogan had helped al-Qadi to enter the country several times, despite being banned by the cabinet. And for those who are wondering, yes, this is actual surveillance footage of al-Qadi meeting with Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey at the time, in 2012. Another figure of importance whose name comes up in connection with this investigation is Ayman al-Zawahiri formerly bin Laden's right-hand man and the current nominal leader of the al-Qaeda organization. According to Edmonds, he appeared as a figure in several FBI counterterrorism investigations in the 1990s, turning up in Turkey, Albania, Kosovo, and Azerbaijan. He traveled to the Balkans in the mid-1990s, and that makes sense given al-Qaeda involvement in the so-called Yugoslav Wars, but his involvement in Turkey and Azerbaijan is of particular relevance to this study. 
Edmonds claimed that he worked, uh, Edmonds claims that he worked with the Turkish arm of NATO and NATO itself during this period, meeting several times with US military attaches in Baku, Azerbaijan in the 1997-1998 window. There are numerous such leads and clues in this investigation that point to, oh, sorry, one more. Other tantalizing connections present themselves in figures like Hussein Baibasin, known as Europe's Pablo Escobar for his heroin operations smuggling heroin to the UK. After his imprisonment here in the Netherlands for drug smuggling, he contacted Edmonds with details about Turkish NATO involvement in the drug smuggling operations he had been a part of. There are numerous such leads, connections and clues in this investigation that point to a deep tie between NATO and US uh, covert operations and this important area of the globe. But what does it all mean? It would be a satisfying conclusion to this investigation to present to you definitive proof, documents, or testimony positively linking the increasingly deadly terror attacks and incidents taking place in the Central Asia Caucasus region to a Gladio Plan B group being directed by NATO and the Pentagon. Everything that we have seen today has demonstrated that A, there are vital strategic interests for the US and its allies in the Central Asia Caucasus region that make it a prime target for covert operations. B, such strategy of tension operations have been conducted in the past by people we definitively know were linked to NATO's covert army, and C, that there are a number of influential people operating in and around the region and in close cooperation with the Turkish deep state, American intelligence, the Pentagon, and NATO, who seem to be involved with ongoing operations today related to the fostering of religious extremism in the region. As I say, it would be satisfying to conclude definitively that A, B, or C persons were connected to X, Y, or Z events, but obviously that isn't possible at this time. The very nature of these covert operations means that without some explosive new evidence or surprising new testimony from other whistleblowers, it is unlikely that Gladio B will be revealed in the way that the original Gladio operations were. Uh, another fascinating story that we could get into but it would take too much time. This does not mean, however, that we are completely powerless to identify these operations or to counteract the psychological effects that they are aimed at producing in the public. The characters, events, and storyline painted in this presentation are almost completely available in the public record through news reports, government investigations, think tank documents, court filings, interviews, and dozens of other sources. Those parts of the story that cannot be independently verified, like some of Edmund's claims, can be corroborated by the sources in the public record. The task of piecing these bits of the puzzle together is a nearly overwhelming one, but it can be accomplished by a concerted effort by an informed and motivated public. This is the principle of open source investigation, which I am attempting to further with my work at CorbettReport.com. And next week, this lecture will be published on my website along with a hyperlink transcript sourcing every single document in this report and other evidence used in the creation of this presentation. From that point, the public is encouraged to use that source information to begin investigating other aspects of this case and to see how this narrative meshes or clashes with other pieces of evidence in the public record. Members of the Corbett Report community are of course invited to participate in this investigation by logging onto the website and posting their own comments, analysis, links, and replies at the posting on CorbettReport.com. This task is critical because in the quest to control the resources of the Central Asia Caucasus region, a strategy of tension is being employed. We see a nearly daily parade of terror attacks in the North Caucasus region on Russia's doorstep and in the new Silk Road area of Chinese interest. Just this month, the head of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, often seen as a counterbalance organization to NATO, claimed that instability in the region was being deliberately fostered by the West, citing a disproportionate increase in U.S. embassy staff and influx of Western-backed NGOs into the region. Quote, the West crudely interferes in the eternal affairs of other governments, trying to manipulate public opinion, economically and financially affecting the government and population, he said. 
If this is indeed the case, then one of the key ways to counteract this effect is to simply retain our skepticism when it comes to spectacular terror attacks in the region. With an increased awareness of covert operations, false flag attacks, and other acknowledged instruments of terror in the strategy of tension, we thereby disarm the effectiveness of these tools. The psychological manipulation that these geopolitical machinations rely on is only possible if the pub public is kept in fear and ignorance, and the answer to that can only be understanding and openness. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention during this very detailed lecture, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Hello friends, James Corbett here back in the sunny climes of Western Japan. I hope you appreciated that presentation. That was the culmination of what has so far been almost two years worth of investigation into Gladio Bees going back to uh, early last year when we of course conducted that original Gladio Bee interview series with Sibel Edmonds. If you haven't checked out that series yet and if you are interested in Gladio Bee, of course that interview series is the gold mine of information that you should check out and of course the link will be in this uh, video so you can go check that out and the transcript of that has recently been provided by an anonymous Corbett Report uh, so user so thanks to that person we now have the transcript of that series of an extremely valuable resource for those who are looking to get more into this information if you do realize how important this information is and if you do realize that if this operation is as is being portrayed in this lecture, it really is one of the most important geopolitical operations ongoing in the world today, then you might realize how uncomfortable it is for me to be in the position of realizing that I am one of only a handful of people in the world who has ever talked about this and who is uh, investigating it at the moment. So I certainly hope that you'll do your part to help pitch in with that investigation. As I say, we do need more people posting links, vetting sources, talking about this information, analyzing it. Of course, if you're a Corporate Report member, please sign into the website and start leaving your comments on this post. But also, if, in any way you can to help spread this information, of course, greatly appreciated because the more people who are thinking about this, talking about this, uh, the, the better it will be for everyone. Uh, trust me, you don't want to leave it in the hands of a few people. Uh, we want this information to spread far and wide. So uh, once again, please start uh, helping out with that in any way that you can help spread this information. Uh, and uh, once again, ob obviously this entire investigation and everything that I do is brought to you by you guys. So I do appreciate your, all of your support, uh, whether that be moral support, whether that be the support of helping to spread the information, whether that be monetary support, which of course I also need. And on that note, since it is December of 2014 and we're approaching Christmas, for the month of December I am doing a 20% off DVD discount for any DVD at the Corbett Report shop. Um, once again, you can go there and take a look at all of the DVDs, the DAT DVDs, the video archives, the Last Word DVD, Century of Enslavement. All, all DVDs, 20% off, just enter the coupon code XMAS, X-M-A-S, uh, at checkout and you'll get 20% off your DVD purchase. It makes it even cheaper and easier for you guys to get these DVDs, give them out as gifts or however you want to distribute them. Um, and of course, you're free to make copies of them and hand them out uh, that way as well. And uh, let's get this information out to as many people as possible. Once again, I do thank you all for your support. And if you uh, did enjoy this presentation, I should note that there is going to be a posting of the audio only, uh, uh, the Q&A after the presentation. I'll be posting the audio of that up on the website in the next couple of days. I hope you'll stick around for that. Thank you again for all your support. I'm looking forward to talking to you again real soon.